I'm Mark Simmons, and I was uh, born in October of 1946, October 20, October 2nd. And I was born in Holdridge, Nebraska, which is north of Wichita and a little bit west. My mom and dad grew up in a little town in southwest Nebraska uh, called Beaver City. And uh, mom, mom grew up on a farm outside about 15 miles of Beaver City, and Dad grew up in town. Uh, mom's uh, Mom's father and mother were uh, uh, he, he homesteaded the property in, in there in, in Beaver, just outside of Beaver City. And my mom and Dad are uh, uh, were uh, high school sweethearts, I guess. Mom was a year older than Dad in high school, and it's a pretty small town, like. 600 people, so uh, so they knew each other uh, quite well, and all their classmates. And uh, so we moved to Salem Springs in 1949, and Dad had been in the meat industry, uh, cut a hay packing company, and uh, he uh, he uh, was selling a, a chickens and and meat products from Cudahy to a guy in Denver, Colorado called Frank Plus. And Dad and Frank uh, decided the chicken business was an opportunity and so they, they bought, or they actually leased a plant in Decatur, Arkansas and, uh, and started, started what was then called Plus Poultry. Frank Plus had the money and Dad had the sweat on his brow. <laughs> and. Uh, and I think actually my mother and dad put some money into the business, but uh, uh, it was uh, it was a very uh, uh, small organization to start with. Uh, and they moved to Salem Springs because, uh, as I understand it, they couldn't find a house to rent in Decatur. So so they found a house here in Salem, and, and uh, so so we ended up in Salem. Uh, it's interesting because uh, right now uh, we're just finishing up a, a history project on Simmons uh, Foods, which was started as Plus Poultry, and my dad bought out Frank's interest in uh, '55. But uh, I've been learning a lot about uh, about our company history. I've, I've heard a lot of the stories. A lot of the stories are in our history or come from me, but uh, I bet we've been getting a uh, uh, lot of other information from uh, from past employees and and uh, current employees and it's it's been an interesting process to do this history plan. It wasn't long after they started that uh, in Decatur that uh, in Decatur didn't have a sewer system at that time. And so there were some complaints about uh, problems with the little stream that ran through Decatur, uh, probably rightfully so, because nobody, nobody had a sewer. Uh, and and uh, Dad was trying to get Decatur to do something, you know, put in a sewer system and, and serve the whole community. And, and uh, there seemed to be resistance. And, uh, and the folks here in Siloam, uh, not only did they commit to put in, in a sewer system and prove it, uh, but they also, uh, uh, and this is something I didn't know, they raised money uh, to help Dad build the new plant. And uh, uh, new, <laughs> it was built. And the interesting thing that I found was they made a decision in 51 to build, and they were running chickens in, uh, in uh, like, uh, the summer of or spring in 1952. So, so they made the decision and got the plant built, started processing in, in uh, less than a year, which just really blew my mind. And, and there was a news article in the local newspaper about uh, uh, a meeting back in early 51, uh, where they, where they uh, community leaders and businesses made a commitment and made contributions. Uh, I think the largest one was uh, uh, may have been $500. 
they raised over over uh, almost twenty thousand dollars to entice uh, Bill Simmons to come build the plant in Salem Springs. You know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, when I was growing up in the fifties was uh, our, our Sunday afternoon uh, recreation was for Dad and Mom and whatever kid didn't have some something going on ride out the countryside and look at the farms and look at the plants that he was involved with and so that was uh, that was my earliest involvement was making making sunday afternoon inspections of uh, of chicken farms and and processing plants i, th I always assumed that i was going to come back to the company and i'm not 100 percent sure what dad assumed but we didn't I don't remember a specific sit-down discussion about what I was going to do when I got through with school, but uh, I, uh, I think my first job was to, uh, was to take over milking a, a small herd of dairy cows that Dad owned personally, and uh, had, he, he was in a partnership deal with a guy over in Prairie Grove and that guy got out of the dairy business and so dad all of a sudden had 50 head of cows that he, he needed to have somebody take care of and so that was my summer job was when I was, I think I had a driver's license. Uh, it was, um, I, I drove to the farm every morning at before daybreak to, to milk these uh, 50 head of cows and uh, and I probably wasn't the best milk can, but I got the job done. <laughs> and so I, I did that for one summer while, uh, while uh, I was still in high school. It was a grade C dairy, uh, cow, to, cow to can. So it, we, had, we had the traditional uh, milking uh, uh, nozzles and, and the milk went in, down into a, a can. Uh, ten, a 10 gallon milk can like you used to see a lot of them around and I was I was not a, a big strong kid I was a skinny uh, skinny kid and I had trouble getting those milk cans lifted up and set into the milk cooper that uh, and so I didn't I didn't fill them all the way the first uh, half of the summer uh, because I couldn't lift them up and put them put them in the cooler uh, so by the end of the summer, I could, and uh, but I but I couldn't raise my arm up over my head to throw a baseball. I had to throw sidearm because because the the uh, work of lifting those cans. So uh, so that was a that was really the first job I had. <clears throat> I, I went to work uh, when I when I was at college. I I worked each summer uh, at at the company, and so. I, I think um, well, I, I did some farm work on chicken farms, and then another summer I worked in the uh, in our uh, older byproducts plant, our rendering plant, where we took uh, chicken viscera and heads and feet and feathers and cooked them down and made feed ingredients. and And we're s still in that business today in a in a big way. That's one of our prime prime businesses is uh, making feed ingredients for uh, for pet food companies and and we're also in the pet food business uh, in a big way canned pet food and then and then uh, poultry uh, for human consumption that's probably the way it ought to be that's the way my son Todd we we introduced him to the business was to uh, to uh, uh, learn the business from from the ground up, if you will, and and uh, earn the respect of the people you're going to be working with, uh, and and are working with. So that was, uh, you know, we did that, uh, and uh, that was uh, kind of uh, kind of almost just happened, uh, but. But as I went through college and and, and uh, worked at the different jobs during college, it was uh, you know I, I gained a huge amount of experience. 
Well, my dad was uh, uh, my dad was really hardworking guy, uh, and he uh, but he had some health issues. One in the fifties, uh, he wasn't necessarily oh that overweight. He he carried more weight than he should, like a lot of us. Uh, but uh, but he had terribly high blood pressure, and that was. In the 50s, that was before there was very many medicines that could control blood pressure very well. And so, uh, you know, if he walked into a hospital emergency room today, they wouldn't have let him left the, the hospital because his blood pressure was so high uh, on a regular basis. <clears throat> and uh, so that, um, you know that really didn't cause much issue until he had uh, he had an, uh, an aneurysm in his descending aorta, and so that's kind of a balloon in the blood vessel. And uh, he had emergency surgery, and I think it was 1960, um, and uh, and so, uh, in Washington Regional they replaced his his aorta from his heart clear down to his legs, which just blows my mind that they could do that in 1960. He nearly didn't survive, but but he did. And um, so he had a couple more uh, health episodes about every two years uh, until uh, he passed away when in uh, 1974, um, after having been in a hospital almost a year. So he... Uh, so I, I was back out of school in 68 uh, and had been working with him and with the company uh, since 1964. Um, and so when he, uh, and, and I'm the only son, I've got three sisters, but and one of them was involved somewhat with the business for several years, but uh, in, in the accounting room. But I was only one of the four children that uh, that did an active day-to-day -day participation. Um, so when Dad was incapacitated uh, about three different times, folks kind of turned around and looked at me, <laughs> and, and I I I didn't you know I I guess I stepped up to the plate. I didn't I didn't uh, I don't remember. You know, going. Hey, this is mine now. But uh, but uh, in '73, when he went into the hospital uh, with a stroke, significant stroke, and really was was uh, non-communicative. He was, you know, he, he could you could talk to him, and he would. I think he would recognize what you were saying to him, but he couldn't speak for over a year. And then he passed away in September of 74. So he, uh, so it was, uh, there was kind of a year period where where things were in limbo. Dad had been sick and got well, had pushed the company and been sick and gotten well and, and pushed again. And so we, you know, we just kind of assumed that he was going to survive, but and so we kept the organization had and Dad had numerous good people working with him, uh, and and so we uh, we just kept things going and uh, and thought about you know, what we were going to do when he got out of the hospital. Well, he did it that last time, so I I basically assumed the responsibility of. Of running the company, and uh, and I was 26 years old, I think, something like that, when he went into the hospital. I may have been 20. I, I was almost. I, my birthday's in October, so I was 27 uh, immediately after he passed away. So that's a pretty pretty good struggle for for a young guy and who had a, had. A, a wife, and at that time we had one child, uh, Todd, who subsequently took over the company. But uh, you know that, that was pretty. Uh, I 
probably didn't realize how the magnitude of what what really was happening. Well, in the early days, uh, uh, well, in in the late sixties. Um, early 70s, we had one plant here in Salon, the process, poultry processing plant, and then we had uh, we had the rendering plant here and outside of Salon, and then had three other rendering plants. And so we were we were pretty concentrated in the rendering business, um, and. Uh, I think it, as far as size at the, in the, in say 75, we probably had 350 employees. We've, uh, we've got over 10,000 today, which is not huge, but it's a lot of people. Um, I think our total sales in 1975 or six were in the 40, 50 million. And, we're going to be three billion this this coming year. So so we've grown a lot, <laughs> fits and fits and starts, and uh, it's, it's it's not just a smooth line. It, you know, we did a number of acquisitions over the years, and uh, so on. Uh, what were some of the key acquisitions that have helped build the company? Oh, in 1982, we bought the O'Brien company that that had uh, chicken processing plant in Southwest City, Missouri, which we still own. I don't think there's an original wall of that plant still standing. Um, it had a, pro a chicken processing plant and a rendering plant and, and uh, we've rebuilt both of those uh, completely since we bought it way back when. Well, Todd, Todd has had a thorough education in operations. Uh, and as opposed to my dad, I, I think Todd and I could say, hey, yeah, we had numerous conversations about what he wanted to do, what, what, uh, what he needed to do to be able to do the things he wanted to do. So, so we talked about, uh, uh, and I, I think he would say that he has always wanted to be a chicken man. <laughs> and so he is, he, uh, uh, we talked about the schooling that he needed, and uh, and and what how to how to get him acclimated into the business. And so we had a a very thorough uh, plan for his early education. The business he did like I did. Uh, his first job was at our J processing plant and hanging chickens, and so uh, so he he did that. You know, each summer uh, he did uh, he did a different tour of duty, if you want to think of it that way, at, at different facilities. Maybe four weeks, three or four weeks at, at a breeder farm, and, and I think the only two places that he didn't get, I'm not sure he ever actually worked in the feed mill, uh, but he worked in in processing and and. Uh, in, on farms and, and that kind of thing. So when he got out of out of uh, college, he was he was grounded in the business, and so he started. Uh, we we gave him a year off out of out of uh, out of school to to do something other than just come back and hit it hard. And uh, he was a sales rep in Colorado for us. We we were servicing the KFCs in the Colorado Utah region, and then also had a lot of business with King Super and City Market out there. And so he he was doing store store detail work out through there. And I I told him I said now when when it when it's winter, you strap the skis on top of the car and you stop at each each ski slope on your way from one store to the next. And so he did that. Uh, and then, and then he got. Uh, it didn't last a year because he he decided to get married, and uh, and so he had to cut his Colorado venture uh, a little bit short to get married. We didn't have, and uh, I think a lot of companies didn't have a mission, vision, value statement uh, back in the fifties and sixties. You just went to work and did what you could, and and our company was small enough 
that uh, that the senior leadership, including myself and my dad, uh, our our values just kind of rubbed off on the organization, and it was uh, uh, it was uh, not uh, well. I didn't feel it was necessary to be able to state everything. In the mid '80s, we we sat down and came up with a set of set of value statements that uh, were were uh, the first time that we did that. And I think we had ten value statements, um, and uh, and then uh, uh, then in the late '80s, we came up with, with a mission statement. And uh, and it was uh, we'd studied it, and looked, and talked about it, and so one of the things that we wanted to do was to have a, a fairly short mission statement that you could say in one breath, and that was pretty easy uh, for people to remember. So our our mission statement still is today: the people of Simmons are building a great company using innovative ideas to provide quality food products and services to a changing world. Pretty simple, straightforward. And you know, there's five five significant points in there. And my dad was a super innovative innovator. He would he would an entrepreneur, he would try almost anything if it had a snowball's chance of uh, of of doing it. Um uh, so so um so that innovation was uh was the first part of it, and and the people of Simmons, the very first part of that is to say, hey, you know, it's not Mark or Todd, or or just the Simmons family. It's all of us have to be together to uh, to make this thing work, and we've got to use innovative ideas, and we've got to make quality food products for our for our people, and we put food products in there because we. You know, we weren't a car company. We didn't make airplanes. Uh, we put some fences around what what we wanted our people to think about and try to do. And then we also wanted to to make sure that that we didn't limit ourselves uh, to what what's going on right now. So that's the changing world side of it. And, we, and that's a, in in the chicken business. If you don't keep up and stay ahead, you won't be there. You know, there were, I think in the 50s, there were probably 150 chicken companies in the United States of various kinds. And today there's maybe 20 of substance. So, so we've, we've survived through, through innovation and hard work and perseverance. And all of those qualities my dad demonstrated with, uh, with a vengeance. Uh, he, he, he really, he really uh, worked hard at it. Well, it's not so much fight the regulation, but a few individuals. We, we accept the responsibility of, and, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of Northwest Arkansas is, is the Illinois River. And, and mostly poultry litter as a, as a quality fertilizer. Um, and then uh, also the the discharge from the various cities, uh, the quality of their uh, treated effluent going into the Illinois River. So you have a, you have an unusual situation here where where the population base is at the headwaters of the Illinois River, and uh, and once you get uh, once you get past Salem Springs. There's very, very little population base until you get down to uh, to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and so uh, the river's very uh, it's a high quality river, and and all of us want to keep it that way and make sure it survives. Uh, there was a time in the early '80s when there probably was more poultry litter being applied to the ground uh, to fertilize our pastures than what was appropriate. So, so there was a push in the 80s to uh, establish uh, 
nutrient management plans. And we did that through, uh, through the state, uh, state resources commissions. Uh, and they relied upon the, uh, the science from the uh, agricultural department. So, so the, uh, most of those nutrient management plans that were first written in the 80s and early 90s, in fact, all of them, <coughs> were based on, uh, phos or on nitrogen as, a, as, the, as the issue of having too much nitrogen in the stream, which, which would cause uh, algae growth. And so the stream wouldn't be as clear as you wanted it because of the algae that was in the stream. Um, so, so we encouraged our growers to develop nutrient management plans for their farms so that, so that the, uh, any water that ran off didn't, didn't have, uh, didn't have too much nutrients in it for the river. And so from that standpoint in the early 80s, recognition that, that, uh, that this could be an issue along with the wastewater uh, going from the cities going into the stream. Uh, we've, we've made progress every, every year. Uh, some folks don't recognize that progress for a variety of reasons. Um, but um, so it's, uh, it's, it's been something that, uh, that we've contended with for, guys, 40 years now. And, and um, today, I think, I think the Illinois River in, two, in 2023 is, is uh, as good a shape as it's been in in a probably four decades, five decades. And that's, that comes from uh, requiring nutrient management plans that include not just not just nitrogen but phosphorus, which is which in the late nineties was recognized as an issue. So we addressed it. Um, upgrading our water treatment plants at the at the five major cities in Northwest Arkansas to include phosphorus uh, limitations and keep keep it improved there and uh, and so uh, and and supporting uh, legislation uh, that required uh, anybody in in a nutrient limited watershed to have a nutrient management plan whether you're uh, in Arkansas whether it's poultry litter or commercial fertilizer if you got, if you're going to fertilize more than two and a half acres with any kind of fertilizer in Northwest Arkansas, you have to have a nutrient management plan that, that your NRCS uh, helps you develop. And it's not quite as stringent in Oklahoma as far as, as far as that. You can use all the commercial fertilizer you want right now in Oklahoma uh, without a nutrient management plan, uh, but. Uh, but if you apply poultry litter, you have to have a nutrient management plan. And we're still talking about those issues. What was it like when you were a kid and when you were going to school here? What was the town like? Well, it was obviously a lot smaller. Um, we, we, of course, I was young. I was three when, when we moved into Northwest Arkansas. So some of my earliest memories are, are hazy. Uh, but, but I can point to the four houses that we lived in between 1949 and 1953 when, when mom and dad were finally able to buy a house on Tahlequah Street. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, the four different rent houses, uh, and I, and I've lived in, I think, I think I'm, I'm counted nine different places in Salem Springs, all within a half a mile. <laughs> right of uh, the radius of, of each other and uh, and so uh, it's been it's been interesting my uh, our house on Tahlequah Street uh, when I went to first grade I went about a half a block to a four-story brick building that had been built by the WPA in the 30s uh, as the Siloam school and uh, the neatest thing about it and uh, was that uh, 
the fire escapes that it had were, were a tube with a spiral circle in it. And so if, 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 uh, if you were in Mrs. Speaks uh, music class on the fourth floor when the fire drill occurred, you had the thrill of spiraling down that and kids coming in on each of the, each of the second and third floor uh, into, into that uh, fire escape system. Of course, I lived, I lived a half a block from there and in the summertime, I'd go over to the school and when it was open, when the janitor was there working, we'd, we'd go up and slide down that thing for, for fun. And, and uh, so I was pretty experienced with it. Uh, and uh, it, it was an interesting time. It's small, you know, it's a uh, small local, local uh, town that uh, you could ride your bike all over town. And, and um, I don't, I'm not sure there were any stop lights. And there were stop signs, but not stop lights. And I know of in 1950, in the mid fifties. Uh, what was it like to drive to Bentonville or Rogers in those days? And how would you go? Well, uh, they, they, Bentonville and Rogers, uh, and Fayetteville were were other very small towns, way far away. <laughs> it seemed like uh, it's interesting because here in Salome, uh, in the late fifties and early sixties, uh, Tulsa was a was an economic influence for us. One, well, I can remember going to Tulsa with Mom to Christmas shop. And and it was a major adventure to go into Tulsa on, on high, old Highway 33, uh, you know, at, at 100 or 90 miles almost, uh, not quite 100. But uh, um, so I think in the, there was a period when, at least for our family, when Tulsa was more important than Rogers, Bentonville, and Fayetteville. Uh, I do remember going to... Uh, to football games in the late uh, late fifties in Fayetteville, and uh, and I uh, when when I went to college it was nineteen sixty four in Fayetteville, and I met my wife Diane there. She was from Texas, but our first um, experience with football was winning all ten regular season games in nineteen sixty four. And went in the Cotton Bowl, and then the next year we won all ten regular season games. So we we were uh, twenty one and zero going into the Cotton Bowl in uh, in Dallas, and and we lost the first game that I, as I as a student <laughs> for me uh, was in it was a Cotton Bowl, and, and we lost it against LSU, and of course that that. That uh, 64 65 uh, team was a uh, you know, famous team with some really, really famous players, the uh, Phillips boys, and, and uh, uh, a guy in Dallas who, who owned now, now owns the Cowboys played on that team. And his, Jimmy Johnson, his coach uh, early on in the Cowboys was on that team. So it was. You know, we, we were in school with some of the legends, Arkansas football legends, for sure. Well, my dad and Mr. Sam were mostly contemporaries. Dad was a little older than Sam. Um, and, and you got to recognize there was a time when, when Simmons Foods was substantially larger than Walmart. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, Sam had, had, uh, when he moved up here, he, he had the dime store on the square and then started uh, the Walmart stores. Um, and store four was here, is here in Salem Springs. Our super center has got number four. <laughs> so so we, we, uh, we absolutely grew up uh, watching Walmart and knowing uh, some, some of the Walmart kids. Uh, and and knowing Mr. Sam's son, my dad and Sam and Cass Huff and, and uh, uh, on the second go round, Frank Broyles uh, tried tried to build an airport 
in a regional airport and back in the late, it probably would have been in the early 60s. Uh, they were unsuccessful. One of the few things that they were unsuccessful in doing. Uh, but uh, they, had a, they had a site over by Tunnington where they wanted to build an airport to replace the Drake Field. Drake Field was a good airport, but it was down, down in a hole and did not have good approaches. And that was before uh, uh, that Drake Fields in Fayetteville, south of Fayetteville. And that was before the modern uh, aviation electronics and guidance systems. And so it was, it, it, many times you'd, you'd try to come in on to Drake Field on a commercial flight, they would not land at Drake Field because they didn't, they, they, it was socked in or, or raining or whatever. So, so, my dad and and Cass Huff with Daisy Air Rifle and Mr. Sam and uh, several others who utilized private airplanes knew the, the need and the advantage of, of uh, modern air travel. And so they got together on two different occasions to uh, to try try to build an airport. I, I've got uh, it's in my son Todd's room, but I've got a I've got a football that that uh, Frank Burles came and to Siloam to to help promote uh, an election to to uh, to support a regional airport and Sam and he gave out footballs and I got one of them. so um, so uh, I've I've got that as a memento from from my early days. So, um, you know, the, Wal the Walton family, uh, Mr. Walton, uh, were, were all hardworking folks, uh, Mr. Sam in particular. And he, he I, I, was, uh, I was a kid and then in college and then the early days of uh, Walmart was when I was running the business and Sam was expanding so fast and I thought man this guy's gonna fall on his face it, it, you know, it, was, it was a struggle in our business to keep uh, uh, our growth at, at you know, six or ten percent and have the have good managers and so on because the poker business has got so many different technologies and different things you have to master. You know, we hatch eggs, we make feed, we have breeder hens that lay eggs, and we have broilers, and then we have processing plants. And so we've got a huge number of technologies that that our people have to master to be successful. And, and I'm not diminishing the complexity of real estate, or re, real um, realtors of of merchants, but uh, it's, I think back then it was simpler than what we did. They bought stuff and they moved it and they sold it. And that they still do that today. It's a little, more, little bigger scale. The logistics side of it is, is, uh, is we now recognize is much more complicated not than it used to be, but to be able to serve people and, and do it in a very economical manner uh, is complicated. And that's one thing that Mr. Sam recognized was, hey, we, we've got to be leaders in efficiency of, of buying and moving and storing and transporting and, and, and retailing stuff. And he was... A uh, master of that, obviously. Uh, Walmart wouldn't have been today what it is without his without his guidance and leadership. I'm sure Mr. Sam's uh, understanding of what it took to get things done in a community uh, was uh, strengthened by the some of the things that he tried to get done in Northwest Arkansas early. Uh, work, working with uh, ad hoc working with other business people uh, where, where they got, where they got together relatively infrequently and said hey we need it we, we need this for our community uh, and and we had you know when you look at 
when you look in back in the 50s and 60s, uh, you had uh, relative, well, small towns, basically. In Bentville, Rogers, Springdale, uh, and, and Fayetteville were not big towns. Salem Springs was, was even <laughs> way smaller. Gent Gentry and Decatur, uh, even smaller yet. So, so we didn't have if you'd put us all together and you know compressed us, we we would have had back then maybe I don't know not even a hundred thousand people, probably probably fifty thousand um, in the fifties. Uh, so today we're five to seven hundred thousand, depends on how how you how broadly you you uh, draw your circle. But, and that's still, you know, that's a small metropolitan area, uh, really, when you think about it. But, uh, um, so, so Sam and the other business leaders up here um, had, had tried to get some stuff done and had, had not been able to. Um, and I wasn't, I was involved I think maybe in a few discussion meetings before the cons before Mr. Sam brought uh, folks together, he invited uh, probably forty people to a lunch, um, and he basically he basically told us where where he had been and where folks like my dad had been and Don Tyson had been involved and 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 JB Hunt was that had become a uh, a significant economic factor in Northwest Arkansas by then. And uh, and so he described some of the earlier efforts and and said basically said we've got to get together. We we've, we've got to put we've got to put an organization together that has substance and we we've, we've got to list out the, some key things we want to do and we got to get it done and so he said he basically told us what to go do <laughs> and he he said and i'm going to ask my daughter alice to lead this effort he, he wasn't an ask <laughs> he told her uh, but he he framed it in a uh, in a uh, as a, as a request, um, and so that was the start of the Northwest Council, um, which I think has made a huge difference in uh, in many many things that have happened in Northwest Arkansas since since that day. And I think that I'd, I'd I'd be I'd be guessing, but I think that date was eighty nine or ninety somewhere along in there. Um, and so, um, one of the one of the first things they did was to uh, was to uh, uh, formalize a board uh, of of directors. Yeah, I think they used the term board of directors, and and. Uh, and I was on it from uh, from our region, uh, and it, there was no there was no real structure on on who how the future boards were going to be. They just brought folks together and said, "Mark, would you be on the board?" And I said, "Yeah," uh, and they did that with about forty people, I think, as I recall. And and one of the major first things they did was hire. Uvalde Lindsay as the the uh, as the uh, uh, manager. I, I I think they probably called him the director. I'm not sure. <clears throat> and and Alice as the chairperson of the board. So so Alice uh, uh, and uh, and Uvalde uh, set out along with Uvalde's wife Carol set out and, and started a plan of action uh, with 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 the board's interaction and support. And so uh, 
Highway 412. We didn't have that name, but that was one of the things. Uh, four lane between uh, Oklahoma State Line and and uh, and uh, Springdale. Uh, getting Highway 49 designated as an interstate and completed to interstate standards from from uh, the Missouri line down to uh, Interstate 40 was one of them. Uh, establishing a, a regional airport was one of them. And so, um, so those four, those three significant projects were, were the uh, regional side of it. Um, and then putting together uh, people of, of uh, uh, just bringing people together from the region so that we understood what everybody was trying to do uh, better and could focus on what we needed to do as um, and, and encouraging each community to do what it should do. Oh. Uh, we, we were all really the leaders were business people there was not you know that was not uh, it was not a governmental thing at all an individual city couldn't go to little rock and say we need to establish a a multi-city multi-county legislation to allow a transportation uh, board to come together so that that's what it, one of the things it took to get the regional airport. We had to establish an, a, a legal entity to be to uh, buy land and build an airport. Well, there was no state legislation to do that. So so we went to Little Rock, worked with a well with our local legislators, came up with a plan to create a state law that allowed four counties and cities to collaborate on transportation projects. So that, that's how the airport authority got established. And I, I, I was being on, you know, they, they asked me to serve on that airport authority board. So I was the first uh, uh, vice chair. Uh, Westmoreland was was the chairman, and and uh, he was he was chairman for I think two years while we were getting things arranged, <clears throat> and then uh, so so that Northwest Council, you know, saw the need and figured and Uvalde and others figured out well we got to have a structure, and so. So the need was demonstrated through the council to the state legislature, to the governor, to be able to get legislation passed. And so Fayetteville couldn't have done that on their own. Springdale and Rogers couldn't have. So it took, took us together uh, uh, create, creating an entity uh, and changing the state law to be able to create the entity that, that now controls uh, uh, the uh, airport authority. Anything else you want to say about the council before we uh, go on to their topics? Well, it, uh, it has been a, an extremely successful organization, I think. Uh, all, all voluntary um, uh, to, as far as the due structure. And, uh, we, you know, we, council goes out and asks businesses Primarily to uh, uh, to contribute. The Wall family has been huge supporters of the council uh, in that matter. They they uh, they provided at more than fifty percent of the funding for a long time. Uh, and then you know Tyson Hunt Simmons and, and many many others uh, came alongside and and supported the council and it still does today. Um, but uh, you know it's it's been an it's been an impressive organization to be able to work with five cities, five chambers of commerce, uh, and, and all of the businesses there, and and to uh, to basically do it without without very many squabbles. 
<laughs> you know, which which is you know, and, and and to be honest, we've if there's been a contentious issue, we a lot of times just avoided it. Yeah, just you, know, you don't have to you don't have to solve every problem in the world. You can you can you can just uh, you can just wait, wait till it gets less contentious. Well, it's been interesting in Northwest Arkansas that you've had leaders, business leaders primarily. Well, we've had really good politicians and leadership in, in most of the cities, but the business leaders coming together has been very, very instrumental. And and so, um, and, and Sam is the epitome of that. Uh, uh, and, and that's carried over to the rest of the family, um, particularly uh, particularly Jim and, and, and his sons uh, have, have been extremely implement, influential in the, in the last two decades. Um, but, but Mr. Sam and, and uh, go back my dad uh, and and others were, were really really interested in helping other people improve their lives and um, and that meant you know good roads uh, good transportation good uh, uh, high quality products in their stores and so on so it, it was uh, you know it's just been a, a, a great leadership experience if someone uh, that had never been to Arkansas or Silon came to you and said, "Hey, Mr. Simmons, tell me about Silon Springs. What's the town like? What would you tell them?" I'd tell them to get off of the 412 <laughs> and go to downtown Silon Springs and drive around, drive around the community, and because uh, 412 is you know the major highway coming through town. It's got all the fast food places and all, all, all uh, unfortunately, the commercial district moved out to what was supposed to be a bypass back in the, in the 60s. Uh, and, uh, but we, we have, a, we still have a beautiful small town uh, with, with beautiful geography and nice, beautiful stream running through it and Sacred Creek and, and a great, uh, uh, Christian College here, and it's just it is just so so um, still friendly uh, town, and it it uh, uh, but you, but you've got to get two blocks away from the main artery to be able to really see where you're at, and that and that's somewhat true of uh, of Fayetteville and Springdale and Rogers. And, and uh, Benville also, you, what you see driving on Interstate 49 is not what 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 we are. It's uh, that's our transportation network. I think my favorite thing about Siloam is is the is the the geography and the people in it, uh, and just a lot of friendly folks, and and the, and the geography allows for twisting roads and. And to, to cross over the creek three or four times while you're inside the town, and uh, see the see the dams in downtown and the small lakes and, and so on. Well, Benton County is is uh, still rural. Uh, it's not nearly as rural along Interstate 49, but it is still a rural agricultural uh, mecca. Wonderful, wonderful environmental uh, considerations. Got lots of uh, environmental amenities up east of Salem Springs. There's a there's a uh, Logan Preserve, which is uh, run by the the uh, uh, Nature Conservancy, and it's it's uh, it's a, a beautiful area that's available to the public uh, over on the east side of. Interstate 49. We've we've got Hob State Park, Beaver Lake, and uh, just all kinds of wonderful things that are that are happening. That that you can see nature and access nature. I just 
not just see it, but you, but you can go play in it and, and get to it. You know, there, there's lots of places in the world that have got beautiful nature stuff, but, but it's hard to get to. Here it's, here it's all scattered amongst us, and, and, and uh, you know, we, we can drive out here a mile and a half and see native prairie that's never been plowed or planted. And, uh, and you can go, go down in the hills and hollers and play in a kayak park and, and that, that uh, has been developed. And, and a second one coming on uh, downstream about three miles uh, that, that uh, is yet to open. So, so it's, uh, it's just quite a place. And, and not to mention uh, world-class Crystal Bridges Museum, you know, my, my goodness. You know, it's it's hard to imagine that it it's been open now. Uh, God, what it what is it? It started in 2011, I think, and and so we're now 12 12 years into it. It seems like it's always been there, but it's so beautiful. I think my favorite thing about Benton County are the people. Just love to work with the people.